All right, so let's resume. Uh, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch and had a chance to network and brainstorm. And uh, if you do come up with great ideas, let us know. Uh, we, we would like to hear about them and fund them. Uh, so keep those groundbreaking ideas coming. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is a close uh, colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Rolf uh, Reisdak. Uh, and he's the chief engineer for guidance, navigation, and control at Institu. And his current uh, R&D role is to pursue of robust autonomy for in situ vehicles. Uh, his product support roles are focused on integration of autopilot functions within the in situ unmanned autonomous systems and associate GNC software builds. Over the past 25 years, Rolf GNC contributions have covered three distinct levels of R&D, uh, fundamental research in flight dynamics and control, evolutionary development in applied uh, flight dynamics and control, and innovation for UAV industry. He serves as board member on regional uh, US first robotics organization and supports the local STEM initiatives. Uh, prior to in situ, he worked as a professor at UW and as a commercial pilot. He obtained his PhD from Georgia Tech and MS from University of Delft in Netherlands. Without further ado, Rolf, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yes, I, uh, I worked um, at in situ, or with in situ rather, uh, since 2001 when, when I was still a uh, faculty at UW and in situ was still small enough to qualify for that S in SBIR. And um, uh, uh, working, uh, working with the university then would provide uh, in situ with, with research funding. And we also worked with the Washington Technology Center here, um, uh, which at the time was just down the street here. I'm a little disoriented, but somewhere on this side of the building. Um, so let me, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, about in situ. And of course, when I, uh, when I put this together, I have to admit, I didn't quite realize that uh, its founder, uh, Dr. Tad McGear, was going to be in the audience. So um, you're welcome to ask me questions either after or during the meeting, but, but not, not Tad, okay? Um, uh, I didn't quite maybe do all my fact checking quite correctly. Uh, here is, uh, was actually uh, um, a brief note uh, from Tad that was really the original idea for a, a small aerosonde, right? Uh, in th the idea behind this was that, uh, look, the, the rest of the United States is kind of benefiting from the West Coast, releasing weather balloons, providing uh, in situ weather data. Uh, but whereas we on the West Coast, we kind of uh, like get only very few little bits and pieces of data uh, in terms of weather that, that is mainly from satellites or from ships taking those weather balloons out in the Pacific. So the idea of, of having a, using GPS at the time to have an, an, an aerosonde that could go out over the Pacific, let's say a full day, and then be retrieved uh, with that sort of data was a very, uh, very interesting idea. And uh, it started with a proverbial uh, garage, uh, garage, sorry, uh, uh, startup, right? And um, and there in the middle is Ted and uh, two of his early colleagues, and they're starting to work on this airplane. Um, of course, a garage shop in in the Silicon Valley that that is about the the price of a small luxury apartment in the Columbia Gorge. So um, one of Ted's friends from Stanford, from Stanford days, Andy from Floto. Um, uh, co convinced him, I believe, to come to this area. And in the background, you, you'll see uh, Andy right here. In the background is one of, of many barns that he had in the middle of his uh, orchard, uh, where um, now, to this day, uh, we build equipment for in situ. And then Andy and Ted together eventually convinced uh, Steve Sliva, yet another uh, Stanford mob uh, member, uh, to do the business end of things. And um, You'll see, I'll show you in a minute uh, how, how in situ, of course, ha has come about. It's very impressive. And all these, all these three folks are uh, very unique, impressive individuals, true role models in the, in the STEM field. Um, here's a little bit of what happened with the aerosonde. Um, you you uh, may recognize the UW wind tunnel over there on the left. The aerosonde was n nicely uh, scaled to fit right into that wind tunnel. That was nice with very little. Uh, wall effect, right? That makes a huge difference because that allows you to get a lot of data without having to put a lot of money in, into a scaled model. Um, now, a lot of work, probably 
uh, uh, Ted can attest to most of the work for over those over those years since that idea written down on that note went into finding the capital and the backing and getting the, the, the this this uh, possibility communicated. And uh, Ted then uh, worked together with UW and pulled off a great stunt um, in uh, 1998 in August. He had um, essentially uh, uh, one of the aerosols. Uh, make it across the Atlantic autonomously, and uh, at that point, a lot of uh, a lot of exposure was brought to to the ability, and and it I think created right uh, like <laughs> like a little over 70 years after Charles Lindbergh did the same thing and created some change how people can conceptualize what these aircraft can do because that's the hardest I think to communicate. Uh, I put a little footnote in there because. Uh, the irony is, is that in the meantime, Arizond idea, the, the, the rights to the Arizond were sold uh, initially to a company in Australia, then became AAI, and now it's Textron, and it's one of our biggest competitors now. Uh, um, here's a little bit of the background of in situ, right? In, in, um, so in situ, uh, um, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit what, what went into some of the work of making that system as small as possible. And uh, initially, Ted was interested in both, you know, getting the attention from NOAA, also getting attention from the tuna fishing industry, right? That like relatively small ships, in other words. But of course, the U.S. military got wind of it, and uh, Steve Sliwa, being Steve Sliwa, saw a business opportunity, and you know, the whole thing kind of exploded. And that um, by the time we find ourselves today, we have uh, 800. Uh, employees. In fact, until about a week ago, I could say we had 800 employees and we just bought a small company uh, on, on the data uh, processing end. So now we're 850 employees. And you see that we're uh, located mostly uh, in the gorge, uh, but our main, uh, our headquarters is really centered in Hood River and Bingen and White Salmon, Washington. So uh, a little bit about right uh, drones, UAVs, small autonomous aircraft. Um, if, if you're not familiar with this industry, you get exposed to it maybe in the news, and uh, typically the media has some very interesting representations of what, what these drones do. Uh, we don't even use that word drones. Uh, UAVs, right, uh, stands for, um, uh, we, we, we use UAV and UAS, Unmanned Autonomous Systems or Unmanned Autonomous Aircraft. Um, and uh, there's, there's now a large variety of them. You can all go on Amazon now and buy them commercially uh, with all the consequences that go with that, of course. But uh, there, there's many different tiers of these kind of aircraft. And uh, you'll see in the bottom left, that's essentially where uh, in situ fits in. Uh, I, I use the word tier, uh, and that, that is not necessarily a common definition. Uh, but uh, in terms of size of aircraft, you see that it's still you can like one or two persons can carry the aircraft. And also, um, we do not have a landing gear. I'll show you what our landing system is uh, here in a little bit. And, and we launch not from a, from a runway, but we launch from a catapult, as, as you can uh, tell. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a demo of that as well. Um, uh, at the moment, we're, we're kind of poised as a whole industry for uh, the civilian airspace to open up. And uh, that is a huge, huge market potential. Uh, of course, we have to deal with lots of regulation. The FAA is involved. The FAA is not known for moving fast. So um, uh, the we, we have talked to many different industries. Uh, some of these industries have lots and lots of money behind it. And they would love to have uh, UAVs do this. For them, the UAV is more or less commercially viable, um, and even though that is still a challenge, I have, to, I have to say, and I can put that in perspective here in a little bit. Um, here are some of the applications that, uh, that uh, UAVs are useful for. Uh, specifically, uh, a, a small UAV system typically is still too expensive, but except for the dull, dirty, or dangerous type of jobs. And um, one of those is, is the tuna fishing industry. And after the 1998 uh, crossing of the Atlantic, uh, Ted had gotten the, the um, attention from this industry and they approached him uh, with this particular problem. What you see here is a tuna fishing boat that can, like this happens to be a very, very nice day. Clearly not all days are like that uh, out in the Pacific or the Atlantic. 
and what you see on top of the roof there is a small helicopter. And that helicopter basically goes out to spot tuna. They can, they can like, they either have, either the, uh, the pilot is trained to be a spotter or it's the pilot plus um, uh, a spotter. And these, uh, if, if you do YouTube on this, like helicopters and tuna fishing, you'll see very quickly how dangerous that is. So having a, um, a small uh, solution uh, would go a long way. And that's where the, uh, at the initially that was called C-Scan, that is now the, the, what is now the, known as the Scan Eagle. Um, uh, in, in, in 2003, 2004, uh, Ted started working on off a small signer, uh, Shackleton, that's right here in Admiralty Bay. Uh, and that was, uh, I spent some interesting sunburned times on that boat too. Um, and, and so that there is a, and, and this is a really nice problem. I've presented this at US First for the kids with the robotics because they have to solve very strange problems with those robots. And I said, well, how about catching an airplane that flies 60 knots and catch it on a very small boat, right? So this, this always makes for wonderful material. Um, so let me uh, talk to you a little bit more about the details of our system and I'll have some videos which, which will give you very quickly a good idea of how that works. Um, so in, in, the, uh, in the system you see there on the left side is the, uh, the nomadic uh, catapult. I'll say a little bit more about that. And then the claim to fame uh, of, of the small, so-called small footprint, uh, relatively small, is the, uh, the skyhook system. It's essentially a glorified genie uh, that there's a, a vertical line suspended from it and we, we land the airplane by flying the, the wings that have hooks at the end into this is um, a vertical rope. And then um, I'll show you the, the ground control system, of course, that, that is behind the scenes how we operate the, uh, the airplane. Now, to put it in perspective, um, some of the numbers here, you'll see that this, this airplane is about 40 pounds and about seven and a half of that is a uh, payload, right? So we can only carry a very small payload. Uh, that, that I see as a common misconception that, um, uh, you know, like all the things you could carry with this airplane is actually very little. Um, of course, relatively speaking, this is, a, this is the same for most aircraft, but uh, definitely size, weight and power on these aircraft uh, have become very important. Uh, this is one of our other varieties of that, of that Scan Eagle, right? The payload is the, the, in the nose is the money-making end of these aircraft. That's the only thing that the customer really cares about. In fact, they don't even care about the fact that it's an airplane. They are just interested in the fact that there's a camera in the nose. Here's the slightly bigger airplane that is the, the newer aircraft, uh, which is now the program of record for the government. Uh, if the Scan Eagle is like a sports car, this is a bit more like a pickup truck. So it's designed to carry a little bit more. Um, uh, but the, the, here the, um, the payload to the airplane weight is about one-sixth. Um, so it's a, it's a bit better. Um, here's an idea of the kind of um, uh, kind of video that's uh, quality that we that we provide now. I'll uh, I'll give you this. This is sort of uh, modern quality, and as you see, it's it's almost this is a typical uh, operation for us where we're about uh, 3,000 feet out and 3,000 feet up. So you could think of it as about a. Uh, let's say 4,100 uh, feet slant range. And it's almost the point where you could recognize somebody, uh, which of course the military likes, of course has also all kinds of implications for, um, for civilian applications. Um, here is a little bit of an idea of the ground system, uh, right? The, the, very significantly, we, we have to always communicate with these aircraft. So uh, the antenna there that is, that is always aiming at the aircraft in order to get a large range, uh, that is our communication link and that is also how we receive video down. And um, you, can, you can tell where this is going. This is also a little bit of the weak link for these systems and that is why the FAA is so concerned. Because it's fine if we put these aircraft in airspace out there, but what if that link somehow breaks, right? Because somebody else turned on a big radio which if you've ever looked at a picture of a, of a military, na like a Navy ship, there's so much stuff on the top of those that sends all kinds of stuff out. So that communication link uh, can get broken um, uh, relatively easily. Um, 
And so that's pretty important. And of course, uh, the, we also are pretty intensive with the operator, like the operator is flying both the aircraft, and I have to, I'll explain that in a, in a in, qualify that in a second, but also the, the operator is concentrated on the payload. When I say fly the aircraft, we, we, we call it operator, not pilot, because we, we try as much as possible to make it hands off. So flying the aircraft means you provide waypoints. You tell it where you want it to go, and you can upload that to the aircraft via that communication link, and at that point the airplane flies its mission. And now the operator is free to concentrate on the payload itself, and then when there's something of interest, either maybe you're mapping a certain terrain, or maybe you're observing uh, a, 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 an object, and you can orbit about that object. That's all that the operator does with the aircraft. So, um, Let's see, uh, here is a, an idea of the launcher. So the launcher is a, a nomadic uh, uh, catapult. Oh, let me, uh, let me back up. How did I, uh, let me, if I, if I don't aim just right on that video starting button here, then there we go. Here's an idea of the launch. <laughs> So as you can see, we, get, we have to put a lot of energy into that airplane in a, in a very short uh, uh, distance and time. And so um, the, the, the typical G-forces are 20 to, to 25 Gs. And here's a little bit of that evolution um, of the launcher. So uh, you see here's the early days. In fact, that is Tad in his car with uh, one of the uh, C-scans on, on top. Um, I think that in the meantime, his teenage daughter may have inherited that car, so it doesn't quite look like this anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, then uh, over time, we, we, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of energy in the system, so the safety, of course, is, is a fairly uh, a big concern. Uh, the amount of energy that, uh, that is contained in that uh, clearly got to um, be carefully controlled and designed. Uh, this was uh, hood tech, uh, the Andy van Flodo uh, was behind uh, most of this design. Uh, what, what you see here, also the shape of, of, that, uh, of the bar um, is very specific. That is to give us as much of a flat, constant acceleration as possible in order to not prevent it, like that, those peak accelerations. Because clearly anything you put on that airplane, you expose it to more than 20 Gs, it's going to have a hard time holding on to that airplane. Um, now here is uh, perhaps the mo most interesting part of the whole system. This is the landing. Um, and if, if you're a pilot, let's see, if you're a pilot, this is always cringe-worthy, but here's, here's how we land the aircraft. And and, and so it's very abrupt, especially on the, on the heavier airplane. Let's see, this is another scan eagle. And there, this is the new airplane. Now, and if you're a mechanical engineer and you're looking at that genie, you go immediately, yes, that genie is not really the ideal solution for this sort of thing. Those genies are made, right, to, to take a force up and down, not sideways. But um, at the same time, this is also the, one of the major distinguishing features of our company versus other UAV companies. Uh, now here is an early idea, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, of, of how to retrieve the aircraft. Here's a little bit of how that, that, that genie idea evolved over time. And uh, you see lots of different flavors and varieties. And so now in the end we end up with this, and I use this for mechanical engineering students sometime to say, well, okay, what would you do to solve this? Um, let's see, uh, um, a few unique design challenges uh, for our system. Well, I just uh, highlighted this, um, this combination, uh, and we didn't even use these tools initially. Initially, it was all, you know, use sort of like uh, envelopes and, and simple simulations to compute what's happening, but uh, we have a unique trade-off, right? If we want to land this aircraft with the leading edge and then on its wingtip, 
that means now um, any any kind of uh, 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 like accommodation we make for this kind of landing on the aircraft is going to have to be carried with it for the entire eight or ten hour mission. Um, so ideally, you want that the the solution space to be and in, in that skyhook. Of course, as soon as we deal with the uh, with the Navy, the Navy says no, you, that skyhook must be portable by two people and must fit in this kind of a box and then gotta be et cetera, et cetera. So pretty soon we're making trade-offs in so many different directions that it gets complex really fast. Very interesting design problem. Um, one of the things that I really love about that skyhook idea, uh, this was way before my time, but uh, it's of course the Columbia Gorge. So there's lots of windsurfing. Uh, one of the guys on the boat right there is in fact somebody who invented some of the first kite boards. And um, initially the idea was, look, we're in the gorge, it's always windy. How about we use a parachute and we tow a line and I think there was actually uh, like one line for towing and then another line maybe to, to stabilize it in the water behind the boat. And then we fly the airplane into that line and then retrieve it, roll it back into the boat. That's how things got started. And it's because you, you, in the gorge you have so many creative people that, that are used to that uh, windsurfing industry, which essentially saying they're a bunch of addicts, uh, addicts, I, I, I think you say. Like they're so into it, like, like they can't do anything else. Uh, and also the carbon fiber layup, right? That, that they have a skill there that were, they were able to make these early, uh, early equipment and the early aircraft with all those skills. So that was really nice as how that came about. Of course, it didn't always work. <laughs> and then you just get one of your youngest engineers to volunteer to go. <laughs> and the Columbia is really, really cold. <laughs> um, in the meantime, it was very successful. Uh, we were on many, many, many different ships. Of course, my favorite is still that Shackleton, and I wanted to share this, this video with you. In fact, it's a video that Ted put together um, uh, like about 10 years ago or so. And um, let me see. And I love this video because now it's, uh, my background is guidance, navigation, and control. And as you see, we just launched off a ship. And here's a picture from the airplane, right, taking an uh, airplane, taking a now look how that ship is rocking and rolling, and we're going to land in that line on the left side there. You see that the, uh, as, uh, uh, as is noted uh, on the bottom, that, that the crew is out on the back deck getting some air, because they're not feeling so well. Um, but now comes a very interesting part, right? We have a GPS on top of that mast, and there's a GPS on the airplane, and look how it's hunting to get to, and now it just flew <laughs> in between the line and the mast. Like here, from the airplane, it looks even better. Look at that. And, and notice nobody's wearing any safety equipment either. Uh, it's like if we do that now with Boeing owning us here, and it happens again. And now look in the background where you see there's another fishing vessel. And we just barely missed that one too. Um, <laughs> It um, was very interesting. And so this actually happened a few more times. And it's just like the, the odds of that happening like that safely is just astonishing. <laughs> and then uh, so eventually uh, they just essentially just sort of uh, fooled the system into thinking that it was a little further outward than uh, the actual conf configuration. And sure enough, and then this time it worked well. There we go. So, and that was in 2004. And I want to just put that in perspective with all these Navy ships and U.S. Coast Guard ships on which we are deployed now. In the background there in the orange is uh, Simon Hales. He's our, now the leader of our SIM team, He's still with the company. Um, Alex, Alex Pitta was one of the Argentinian fishermen that approached Tad originally. And there's Tad doing the hard work himself. And then there's Guillermo right there on the, on the very right side, also an old Argentinian fisherman. Um, let's see. So anyway, I just love that video so much that even after all those years, it makes a lot of, uh, it, it, it clarifies so much of the challenges that we have to solve. Um, so let's see. Uh, um, Maran, you made that introduction of me so long that uh, I'm, I'm running a little short on time here. So, sure, uh, 
Um, I want to highlight something about uh, uh, simulation, right? It's very important uh, for our uh, for our work to to have simulation. And the, the the irony is, like I've dealt with the Navy now, meaning the government, uh, uh, like government engineers looking over my shoulder as we put the GNC on the aircraft and put the whole system together. And um, so many, many discussions and meetings I've met with them. And uh, in the meantime, we, we created the, like a simulator with them to evaluate how the system works. And of course, it takes on a life of its own. You get these engineers that are focused on a particular system or a particular uh, subject matter expert, uh, expertise. And in the meantime, we have created this string of lies Right, because everything here is simulated, like the, the atmosphere is simulated, the airplane is simulated, the ship motion and, and also the air wake over the ship is simulated. We simulate GPS signals and all their characteristics and then we put it all together. But of course we make approximations in all of that and then we close that whole loop and then we start flying at, a sh at like we do it, you know, let's say 20,000 times and then they make conclusions. All oh, that looks safe. And uh, they sign off on it, and I just keep my mouth shut because I go, okay, good, next. Um, but the truth is, it's it's really a, a really interesting challenge to to come up with this sort of system and simulate it and make a good assessment of how well does it work. Um, really, what we can say with a good simulation is we can at least address sensitivities uh, where the modeling is accurate or not. Clearly, uh, it's a small aircraft. There's no people on board this aircraft, so we can't really justify the full-blown commercial aviation type of simulation, and there's no need for that. Um, let me, uh, I'll, I'll skip through this because it gets a little complex, but the um, uh, little more than I wanna, uh, that I have time to discuss, but essentially this is the end result that, that the, the, the Navy sort of uh, uh, check boxes are concerned with. They wanna see a simulation, they wanna see sort of what happens if in all these different conditions, different sea states, different winds, different kind of airplanes, uh, can they make it to that same skyhook? Does it land safely is what they're interested in. So um, it, like I said, like each and every one of those dots has so many approximations in it that who knows. Um, I, wanna, I wanna show you a little bit about where we're headed and what the challenges still are. Uh, and there's still many really interesting things to be resolved. Um, one of the uh, trends, of course, that, that everybody gets excited about, well, everybody at the, on the in-situ side, including some of the executives, and I always have to sort of be the, the voice of reason because uh, here, here is a block diagram that represents the aircraft avionics. Uh, part of that avionics is what we call the autopilot traditionally, so there's sensors in there, then, then um, you, you put a, a state estimator the, or data fusion uh, element in there. And then we have, of course, the control loss that stabilize the aircraft. And now, of course, uh, you can, you can like people come out with their telephone, like an Android telephone, where they can navigate with just using whatever cameras on that, on that phone and the few uh, sensors, the, the accelerometers and gyros in the phone. And of course, those phones, billions of those are made, right? The autopilots we buy are you know, more than 10,000 bucks a piece and only a few of those are made, relatively few. So wouldn't it be nice if we could indeed use the kind of material that goes into a phone? And in essence, that was really what inspired Tad's original idea by using GPS and a very simple sensor to um, make this capability of an aerosond. Uh, of course, the counterpart of that is those phones are definitely not providing the same kind of performance that in the meantime, our customers pretty sophisticated customers with pretty sophisticated payloads come to expect. So that is often an explanation I have to make. Uh, now similarly with the image processing in the loop, right? If you're a controls person, you start anytime you, f you close a feedback loop, you start asking these questions like, hey, what is the effect of closing this feedback loop? Well, the problem is with image processing, image processing does an amazing amount of things and you can get open source software online Really, really cool. Lots of lots of work has gone into that, and and those tools being so openly available is is very nice. Makes for very creative uh, um, uh, work. But when you put that in a loop, those image processes are still very efficient, but not robust. Right? As soon as the angle of the sun is different, or as soon as it's a little bit hazy, 
the, like you can't rely on it anymore to put that inside a closed loop for an airplane. Or you can turn it around and say, hey, are we going to rely on this for that airplane to, to see other aircraft and avoid other aircraft? Well, you know, if the sun is just right, maybe it'll avoid you, but will it also do that if, if the sun is somewhere else? Who knows? And so that question is a really significant question, and that's going to open up a lot of interesting academic wor uh, work. But my point is mostly for our executives, it's still academic work. And um, in order for us to bring that to the customer. Now, let me, uh, let me um, uh, end, end a little with this note. In terms of autonomy, only recently have, have people started formalizing all these different levels of autonomy. And autonomy is a very sexy word, in, again, in the guidance navigation and control world. Um, and that's what we're after. We even refer to it as autonomous vehicles. Um, and if you go to the very top level of this, of this diagram, you, you see those um, uh, statements like negotiating, decision making, situational awareness, that's a big one, understanding of context. And in other words, that top level right there is the, the level that, that Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk are warning us about. That by the time we're there, the UAVs will take over, right? <laughs> um, well, the reality is that red line is where we are. Uh, that is between level zero and level one. Level zero being remotely controlled aircraft, and level one is essentially where we operate automatic flight control. In other words, we're not really autonomous, we're automatic. And we've got a long way to go. So that should make a lot of students very excited. Um, Let's see here, I, I want to uh, uh, close with this remark about the engines. Uh, the engines is still our biggest challenge. The reliability of the engines is, is really an issue because the engines are so small. So we're really pushing the envelope on that technology, right? We are, our engines are the size of the stuff you find on your lawnmower or our moped. And um, here are some of the, uh, some of the early pictures. Uh, I, like, I like that one in the bottom left, that, that was our sense of safety, was to put a ladder on, uh, on both sides of the propeller. Um, here, um, I'm not allowed the, to give you numbers, uh, so I thought I'll, I'll do it another way to give you an idea of, of what the engine, the early engines on our Scan Eagle were about the, the price of a Toyota Yaris. And um, then we got more sophisticated because the Navy wanted heavy fuel, heavy fuel meaning like diesel type of fuels and jet, jet fuels, even though we still use a spark plug, they want to be able to run those. So then the price went up to like a, a modern day Volkswagen Passat. And then the new aircraft uh, actually went up a little more. Uh, and, and this is for one engine. So like you can get, maybe if you're lucky, you can get about a few hundred hours out of an engine like that. Um, and so, in other words, we have still a long way to go in terms of engine technology to make this affordable uh, for, let's say, a farmer to be able to use a system like this. It's still much cheaper to go to your local airport and rent somebody in a Cessna. Um, of course, in the meantime, uh, maybe you've seen one of the posters. Uh, uh, our chief engineer for advanced uh, products, uh, Jeff Knapp, is working with uh, WSU, uh, uh, Jake Leachman, and they're uh, doing some interesting work that I'm not allowed to say too much about either, but uh, we'll, we'll see where, where, uh, where this could possibly go. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you know, maybe, maybe electric propulsion is something that could solve some of our problems. Um, uh, I, I personally believe that the evolution of, of the, the engine technology as we've been working on will be around for a while. But uh, this is uh, interesting development that happens in Washington uh, with, uh, again, under a Jay Gotti funded program. And with that, uh, I see Moran is circling around to snatch me off this uh, stage. Um, I'll, I'll conclude this presentation. We have time for a few questions.